this morning I had a chance to lead a young couple to the Lord because of the angels pushing them and pulling them and bringing them to the church. So I just wanted to encourage you, God is on the move. He does not want us to, to put our eyes on the messenger, but on the, on the message. But we cannot ignore the messenger and the greatness of what God is doing. I, I feel a, almost a, a feeling of awe when I even talk about God's goodness in, in bringing messages to his people by angelic beings. Because I, I know that as I, as I look at an angel, as I hear a message, I know that that, that message says that God cares about us enough. It, it isn't the angel that stands there. It's, I think, of God who is, has, cares enough to bring that message to my heart. And it just makes me feel like I love God so much more. Praise God forever. And though there are some things that may sound a little humorous in the ministry of angels and the work that they're doing, there's still such a feeling of awe surrounding it. I, I had had two encounters with, with Gabriel in bringing me these messages that I brought to you. I couldn't see any detail. I could see the outline of a, of a being. But it was dark. The shades were drawn. It was nighttime. Just enough enough light from outside I could I could detect the being but I there was no question mark about his presence or about the message because when he came he grasped my arms when I was asleep wanted me to be sure and be awake I suppose and he pulled me right up in bed like that and it uh, it scared the daylights out of me the first time What would you think you know, when you're sleeping if somebody grabs you and sets you up and was so strong that I couldn't even twist around? And I was frightened because there is such an awe there. And uh, when he told me that God had sent him because the prayers of his people had been heard and he had been sent with the message that God had answered their prayers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I felt better then. <laughs> Praise God. But even then, as I, as I mentioned before, I, I had a strange feeling about whether the message would be accepted or not because, you, you know, there's, you, you hear of very many uh, encounters like this. And so I, I did suggest that he bring the message himself since he was here. And uh, I would introduce him and, and let him bring it. But he... He said no, but that he would be here, and he's been here many, many, many times since, along with a, a host of angels. But it was, several weeks went by before I had in another encounter, and I, I would have been content, actually, if that was the only time, because uh, it, it would be, it's a life, it's an experience of a lifetime, knowing that, that God has dealt with you in that way. But it didn't stop. And about uh, five weeks after the first encounter, three weeks after I had another time when he sat me up in bed, I still didn't see him but saw his outline. But two weeks after that, I happened to notice a, a blue, a bluish light, just kind of a, a glow coming up uh, from the staircase. And I thought... Possibly I'd left a light on in one of the other rooms and it was just the dim light that was coming up the stairs. I knew it was too dim to, uh, to be the light right in the staircase. So I, I decided to get up and go down and, and turn that light off. And I got halfway down the stairs and the, the, the stairway light came on, just flip like that. And I saw two of the largest men I have ever seen in my life. 
And uh, it could have been fright. I don't think it was totally fright. But I, I feel that there, there is a, a radiation because they, of the fact they come from God's presence of divine power. Very similar to being slain in the spirit. And my, my knees buckled and I started to fall down the stairs. I couldn't, couldn't stand up. And uh, it, uh, maybe you can get frightened enough to do that. But whatever it was, I was falling down the stairs. And uh, uh, the one that was the spokesman reached out to hold of me. And my strength came back. Uh, so I didn't uh, hurt myself. Then he told me. I asked him why. I hear he, he, he told me who he was, that he was Gabriel. And he introduced me to... Uh, the one that was with him and said that gave me his name and I, I've met him since that time too his name is Creone and uh, I assume from that that all of the angels have names and I learned something else that no two of them look alike they're different different sizes different hairdos the uh, uh, one angel uh, was a warring angel uh, and uh, Gabriel is a ministry angel, but the, he, the warring angel travels with him. And the uh, this warring angel had a hairdo much like uh, much like uh, this fellow's here, uh, or a little bit like Mike's, kind of curly, yeah, you know, like that, you know, uh, but a lot better looking. He looked to be about 25 years old. Now, I tell you, he would have been good looking if he had looked like Mike. But he, he looked to be about 25 and uh, huge. If, if uh, you just guess a weight, though I don't know how he would weigh an earthly pound, but uh, if you just guess a weight, he would weigh, I would say, close to 400 pounds. Huge. Seven, seven feet or more in height. And uh, uh, dressed with a... A, a brown pullover shirt. Gabriel had a, a silver-colored one on. This warring angel had one that had had the tie and the uh, like, not a tie like this, but like a shoelace. Uh, it was split part way down, then a sh like a, a a lace that tied it together. And uh, they were. I asked them, "Why are you here?" And they said that, that the Holy Spirit, and I learned some things, some beautiful truths, that the Holy Spirit, who monitors the whole earth at one time. Now, I, I, this is one of, Sunday morning I was talking about academic truth. Well, academically, I knew the Spirit was everywhere at once, but it, it didn't ring a bell inside until he told me about this. He said the Spirit monitors the whole earth and picks up the signals from everywhere. He can even hear the, the bird as it falls to the ground from wherever it is. He can hear the softest footstep. And, uh, and he cares. But he said that, that in, in, in monitoring and seeing what's happening through the whole earth, that he sensed a massive buildup of satanic forces that were wanted to attack me and uh, so the, the Spirit then not only monitors, but he sends out the orders. And so he sent out the orders to go and, and scatter those enemy forces. And so I was a little concerned. I, I didn't want them hanging around there if those enemy forces were going to attack. But he said, we've already, already gotten the job done. Already gone. And I, I did ask him then. I said, well, what does it take to, to get... Uh, the spirit to send out these forces to help people and uh, I asked him if if it was an answer to a call normally for help and he said no he said that that if if the spirit waited until we knew about an attack we'd already be in trouble but he said that the spirit is sending them out and he said this isn't anything unusual we're doing this all the time with everybody. We're holding back the enemy forces. We're scattering them. Praise God. And he, then he asked me to, to uh, take
take a look out of the window. I looked out of the window and there were about a hundred of these men like, like this big warring angel. And they, they'd already gotten their job done. I didn't count them, but it looked like about that many out there in the driveway stand. They were just casually chatting with each other. Uh, and uh, it uh, made me feel pretty good, though, to know that, that, God, that God has ways and means of taking care of his people, you know. Praise God. He told me about the spirit of iniquity that is working in the world today, an attempt by deceiving spirits to try and get God's people sidetracked from, from embracing the living Christ. Christ wants to be a living, pulsating person to every one of us. But he said that, that there's a tendency today, and this, because of these, these deceiving spirits, to uh, cause people to take their eyes off of Jesus and what he's doing, and, and heap to themselves teachers longing for, for the, the, the Bible to be so dissected and put into pieces and categorized that it, that it loses its life. But he said, read the word, feed on it. Let, let it become the living word to you. Hallelujah. Not just, a, not just some columns of, uh, uh, of truth or opinions of men divided up uh, he he referred to he referred to Christ being known as as a blackboard Christ, or as a as a uh, diagrammed Christ, or as a as a printed Christ, or as a, even a flannel graph Christ. He said instead he wants to be known as the living Christ, walking off the pages of the Word with us. Hallelujah. This was, this was a message that I, I felt was so, so terrific. But he did say that, that, that through these other things that sound spiritual, he said people would be ever learning. By the time they've learned one type uh, of a study or an opinion, it's, a, it's kind of out of date and they've got to start in again, over and over and over again. Ever learning, never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. But he said, feed on the word. Feed on the word. Hallelujah. Don't settle for, for, for the dissected word and where it's all torn into, into little bits and analyzed in its, in its sections. Keep it the living word. Hallelujah. Boy, this, this was exciting to me because uh, I, I, there's no substitute for Jesus with you and in your life. <clears throat> then... Uh, they told me that, that the, he told me a little bit about the angels, the different ranks of angels. There's the, there's the, uh, the uh, praise angels, the worship angels. Uh, there's the uh, ministry angels. And there's the, the warring angels. But he said regardless of their, of their function, they all have one, one uh, uh, highest purpose, and that is at the name of Jesus. When the name of Jesus sounds in heaven or on earth, they, they have to fall and worship the name of Jesus. Praise God. Because he is so exalted before them. Oh, there were, there were many, many beautiful truths like this that, that they gave to me. Uh, he, he talked to me about, uh, about the, the, everything that God has promised is already completed as far as God's book in heaven is concerned. And uh, in trying to help me to understand, I have a, a very crude diagram that uh, Gabriel took a, a pencil that I had in my hand and, and I was writing some things he gave me and he said, and, and he drew me a kind of a, just a rough sketch of a, of a picture frame. Everything God has promised is complete in this. But he said, here in a little old spot, we often will look at something that we don't think is done yet. And that whole thing fills the frame and hides, hides what God has done. But he said, when you, when you look to Jesus instead of the, instead of the problem, like he, he used the scripture, the verse, that when you, when you pass through the waters of trouble, he will be with you. He said, if you look at the waters of trouble, it will hide the picture. But if you look at, he is with me, then you, then that that little piece that looks so so 
uh, ominous to you has to shrink back into its into its place and, and you see the whole thing complete everything God has promised all of our whys are complete in Jesus praise God <clears throat> Gabriel spoke with me for oh for a long time that was when he when he talked to me about the meaning of the real meaning of the death of Jesus and while he talked about it he, he let me let me literally live in the scene of Jesus' agony and his suffering. And I, I saw it was not physical. It was, it was, he said, his soul was suffered and pressed to death. It wasn't his, his body. His very, his very, very life faced that death. And I, when he told me about this, I sobbed. I couldn't help myself. I asked my wife in the morning, I said, did, did, I, did the bed, did, did you know I was crying? She said the bed was literally heaving because I was sobbing so hard, crying because of the anguish of a soul that I felt. But then he let me see something more. He said, let me see, show you now what happened after that suffering and death. And the, the, the crowning of Jesus as our great high priest as he went into the presence of God and, and the, uh, he, he went, left the throne of heaven as a spotless lamb. He came back la laden with the sins of the world, with the filthy garments upon him. And then uh, we, this garment was taken from him and destroyed, removed forever where it will never be found. And then the, the uh, crown was placed upon him in a new robe. Then this angel said, you know what happened when he sent forth the Spirit. Jesus said, I'll take of the Father, I'll receive of the Father the promise, and we'll send him out to you. But let me show you how it actually happened. And he, he let me see Jesus. There were, there were some other things here, but I'll just meant to make this brief. He let me see Jesus as the, as the lamb that was slain, the sacrifice. Lying there, still and dead but then as he was before the throne of God this lamb stood up in resurrection but instead of a lamb standing up it became became a, a, a mighty mighty ram that had seven huge horns on top of his head and he said now uh, he allowed John he let me see it as, he, as John saw it he said that that the horns in that day and represented power. When they spoke of a horn, it was always the horn of power. And he said that the fact that, that, this, that this lamb had seven of them spoke of the completeness. The number seven is divine completeness, wherever it's used in the Bible. And that this ram had the seven horns, speaking of, of complete, total power. And then he said, this is what Jesus meant after the resurrection when he came down and walked with his disciples in Matthew 28, about verse 18 to 20, where he said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Hallelujah. When Jesus came forth from the grave, he came forth with all power in heaven and in earth. Praise God. And then he let me see the, the Holy Spirit being given to him. And it was likened to the to seven eyes. And these, he, he, he gave me the references for this. In, uh, in, Zechari in uh, Zechariah uh, 3 and verse 9, where he refers to the... To the uh, in, in Zechariah, he, because the, the permanence of what he wanted to picture, he gave him, showed them seven eyes in a stone because a stone was so enduring and the Holy Spirit is eternal. Stones were considered eternal in that day. So in order to let him see it and fit with his own thinking, he let him see it as a stone with these seven eyes. But those eyes, those eyes represent the different capabilities of the Holy Spirit, which is ours. And, in, and then he gave me the reference in Revelation 5, 6, where, where this lamb was seen. And he, that lamb had the same seven eyes as he raised. And that, that's the... the uh, 
the Spirit of the Lord. The seven, that's the complete knowledge, complete understanding, complete power. All of these things, the seven again is the completeness. So what he's telling us is that all knowledge, all understanding, complete, all seven, and all power is given unto me. And lo, I am with you always. This, this was the way he allowed those prophets to see him, you see. And he, he, he gave me the scriptures to show, the, the, to back it up there. But to me, it, it's so exciting not only to see academically. Well, I already knew that Jesus said all power is given to me in heaven and earth. But now when, I, when you see it actually in action, it takes on a, it takes on a meaning. It, it, it throws a big light on it. Instead of a, a flat picture, you see it a moving picture. Something really in action. I had so many people ask me if the Spirit had, had, or if Gabriel had said anything about the return of Christ. And he, he hadn't. So I asked him the question. If he, could, if he could tell me anything about the return of Christ. And he said that, he said that, it, that Jesus is coming, but it's something that God had reserved in his own knowledge. He said that, that everything else that's been predicted, he has the timeline except this, but God has kept this in his own power. But he did say, I can tell you this, that there has never been such excitement and activity in the courts of heaven since Jesus came the first time as there is right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said he couldn't tell me anything, but he said something that made me feel pretty good. And then I, I, I kind of, my mind took on from there and said, Oh, Lord, you can come. Come quickly. Praise God. He's getting ready to. Getting ready to come. Praise the Lord. He, he re-emphasized to me the fact that these, these, spirit, these ministering angels were out working and bringing people. And he, he, he uh, emphasized again the fact that, that I must gear up and we must be prepared to help these people that come. And he, he, then he gave me a little Bible lesson on the fact, he said, you, you have accepted the, the, the teaching that Jesus is the door and that we're, you're bringing people to the door. But he said, God wants you to know that you are the door. And that when Jesus said, as my Father sent me, so send I you, and as he is, so are we in the world, and he's given us not only, his, not only his Holy Spirit, but he gave us his job. You see, we are the door then. They, people can't find Jesus as such in this world, but they can find us. And we become the doors all over the place. Hallelujah. And he wants you to take the same kind of authority that these angels are taking and not listen to anybody's ob objection when they come. Not everybody that comes your way will, will be brought by the Spirit. But God wants you to be sensitive enough, sensitive enough to where if you hear... Uh, a words that they're saying or sense the discouragement or, 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 or in some way he indicates to you that this is one that's being brought. He wants you to be on your toes and ready to pull them on through. Let them know that angels are at work and that if they, that they cannot get the angels out of their hair by saying, I just am going to refuse, I don't want you because they won't listen to that. They'll start the cycle all over again. And if they refuse again, they'll start it again. But they're not, they, they don't get discouraged. They've been working with people too long. And they're not going to get discouraged. They, they're taking their orders from heaven. Praise God. He said, we're the door. He also said that we're the living word. When we feed on the word. We actually become the living word. And that, that, uh, that, that muscle that John here has, all that muscle, uh, you don't see stuck all over him steak. That, that muscle represents a lot of steak that he ate. But uh, now it's not spelled steak. It's spelled John Post. Uh, he, he fed on a lot of steak. It was steak when it went in, but now it's John Post. All that energy, all that muscle. When we feed upon the Word of God, we become a living Word. That Word turns into R.H. Buck. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we become the Word then. And we, we give the Word to people. We can speak in His name. And then, he, then we get His authority. As we read in, in John, the 20th chapter there, where He said, Now, 
I, he breathed on him and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, you can say, Who's, you can follow his authority. Whosoever sins, you remit. As they, they've come God's way and they say, Jesus, I accept you, you tell them. That's what God asks you to do. When you sense that sincerity, you can tell them that God has accepted them. You don't have to let them stumble around in a fog, waiting, waiting to, to say, well, uh, waiting for them to tell you what salvation is. God has made you the authority. You're his representative. And you can say, because of this, and God will back you up in everything you say. He said he would. Hallelujah. Whosoever you free, he said, I'm going to free. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't we living in terrific days? Praise God forever. There's going to be a lot of things I won't be able to tell you tonight. Some things that you're not ready to take because I know that they would, uh, they would they'd blow your minds clear apart. But uh, I am going to tell you some things that, that might even blow your minds, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, I went, the, the, a week ago Sunday, when I went downstairs... And uh, this big warring angel was in the kitchen chatting with, with another warring angel. The two of them were there. Gabriel, Gabriel told me that he had to go and take care of a problem that somebody, somebody in the church here was having. He, I don't know who it was. He, he forgot to tell me, or maybe he didn't want to, but he went and helped somebody here. He, he got a, and these angels, by the way, were, were picking up messages from the Spirit all the time. The, fir the first time that I actually saw them, when they would get these messages, they would they would converse together, but not in English. It was a, it was a, evidently a heavenly language. They'd talk together back and forth, and uh, uh, they would pick up reports, I suppose, of great victories. And uh, they they just laughed. Oh, they got so happy and and uh, about some of the things that they were hearing. Uh, this uh, warring angel spent probably at least an hour fooling around with Queenie, tickling her ears and getting her on her back and playing with her. And uh, Queenie lapped it up. She, she thought it was great stuff. But uh, I wish she could talk. I'd like to know what her impressions were. But she, uh, she had to say that. But uh, she's, had a, she's had a rare experience for a dog. <laughs> But this first time that I saw them, I'm, I'm kind of running things together here, but I, because I can't tell you everything I want to tell you some things that would be of interest. Uh, Gabriel went to the door, and uh, I thought he was going to go out. He had his hand on the doorknob, but he, he talked with me and said that he had to leave because of a, uh, of a real call of the Spirit to go and help someone. But he... He said, I've asked uh, Creone to stay here in your house with you and uh, during this time while I'm gone. But he said, I'll be back. And it, it seems so strange. While, while I was looking at him, he just, there was no flash, no sound, no, nothing. He just literally vanished. I was, I was looking at nothing. And uh, this, is a, this is one of the hardest things that, for me to understand. I was, I was holding on to and talking with a firm, solid individual, big, muscular, uh, and the next instant there was nothing. He vanished. But this, this isn't, uh, though it's hard for us to understand, this isn't something that, that uh, is new. You can read all through the Bible. They, they appeared and they, they had to, as God uh, would, would give them orders to appear or to disappear. When I found these two in the kitchen talking, uh, the, f the first time this warring angel couldn't speak to me because he had not been directed by the Lord. But I, when I, they were in there, I, I went in the family room to, to write down some of the things that Gabriel had told me. I didn't know that these others were down there. And so I started writing and I heard them talking. I heard the the deepest bass voice that you could ever imagine in there. It was deeper than John Hall's. He had made tremendous bass soloist. Deep voice. He was just really rolling it out. I, I uh, went around to look in the kitchen and here he was with another big warring angel. 
They were talking in, in this heavenly language. When he saw me, he came over and said that God had, had uh, given him uh, had given him permission to to speak with me, and that uh, he'd he'd be glad to talk with me about some things that uh, might be of interest. Well, I didn't really know what to ask him. I knew he was a different kind than uh, than Gabriel, uh, but uh, I might say too, because you might be going to ask me about this. Their clothing was was radiant; it kind of glowed, iridescent. This is why I was getting the light up the stair. And their skin was also, I had a, had a glow about it. Their eyes, I would recognize these eyes anywhere. They were like, like balls of fire. They were, they were compassion, you could feel it. But they were like they would look right through you. There weren't the pupils and the iris and so on as you see normal eye, but they were just like, see, holes right through them. I could see why, why when John saw Jesus, and in the Revelation, he said his eyes were as flames of fire. And he also had shining garments. And I feel that there's something about the presence of God that creates a glow or a shine. You remember when Moses was in the presence of God, even for just 40 days, he came down and they had to put a hang a veil over his face because his face shone so much. He was in God's presence. And when these men came down and talked with Jesus on the mount, said that they, they had, uh, what was the word, uh, Blistering garments, and they, they, they shone, and there there is this there is this brightness about them. But when uh, when he chatted with me a little bit, uh, I just I felt I felt a tremendous awe. Oh, there was joy, you know. But I I don't know whether you can project yourself in there or not. I I felt a tremendous awe in the presence, not only of Gabriel but this these angels because of their greatness. And uh, so I asked him, uh, I said, there are some things that I wondered about. What do the angels do in between the times that we know of their appearances? Because I said, there's three or four hundred years went by in the, in the Bible before we read anything about them or heard anything about them. And I said, is there, is, how do you keep from getting bored? I suppose I asked him kind of the wrong question. He looked at me so puzzled when I asked him about that, he said, he said, well, all those appearances where were times when the Lord just happened to open the people's eyes so they could see us. He said, we never, we're busy all the time. We, as long as there are people around to take care of, he said, we're just busy as we can be. They're already, they're already in eternity. Time means nothing to them. Their age is nothing to them. They're already in the, in the area of eternity. And, uh, so, but they they did they they mentioned the the the, uh, the the work that they're doing. I asked him then. He he talked about different things in Gabriel was dead. He did tell me a little bit about uh, things pertaining to their work. They said that God cares for people so much that human beings would never 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 know how much God cares for them, even people who hate him. He cares for them and loves them. And they have to take care of wicked people, ungodly people. They are they're taking care of them all the time. He said, you can never know the, the love of God. It's just too great. You can never comprehend it. And he said that it, that it was so amazing to them how that people could, could, uh, could, could curse and, and, uh, and hate God and turn their backs away from God. But God would never turn his back, away from, turn his back on them. Because he loved them so much. In his arms, I keep reaching out to them. He, he loves them so much. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you say praise God for that? Oh, hallelujah. But he didn't have messages like Gabriel did to me, but uh, because I could see he was concerned about other areas of, of care. And so I asked him, uh, could you tell me what, what some of the what would you would consider the greatest uh, one of the greatest experiences you've had? As I, I figured, I just well get some questions as long as the Lord has let me talk to him, you know. And so he said, "Oh, he said I, I've had so many tremendous uh, experiences, but he said one of the one of the most exciting and one that that actually was vivid in his memory was when 
was when he helped lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> Again, I was reminded how old he must be, you know. But he said, he said, God gave us the right, told us to, to uh, punish the Egyptians in any way that we wanted. We could use any of God's weapons to punish them. And he didn't, he didn't say it was fun, but he did say it, was, it, it fixed itself in his memory as a, 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 a real tremendous time because of the great deliverance when the sea was pushed back. He said God let them use every form of punishment that there was on the Egyptians. He said they threw lightning bolts at them. They, uh, they, uh, they, they shook them up. They, they pulled their wheels off their carts. They, they, they used everything that there was. And uh, in, in reading it in the, in the Psalms and reading Josephus, I read, I, I find out that that's exactly what they did. And it says there that there was not one thing that God used to punish man that he didn't use against the Egyptians on that day. And this, this is what actually, actually took place. Then he, uh, he told me of another interesting time when uh, Israel was on a forced march. Oh, let me, let me put it in this uh, setting. He did make a statement as to their, as to their particular work. He said that, that they had orders not to interfere with, with man and with what God was doing in, in man's normal uh, course of life. But their orders were to intervene, but not interfere. A whole bunch of these warring angels, he said, made ice balls. And in, so Israel was too tired to fight. And it was God. God had decreed that Israel would have the victory. And so they had to have the victory. But they were too tired to fight. And they would get wiped out. So he said these angels took these ice balls and threw them down on top of the, the, uh, uh, the other forces. Just blasted them with ice balls. And I, they gave me the portion of Scripture and to read it, it says that, it, that, that God threw hailstones at them. But he said they were ice balls, so I suppose it means the same thing. Uh, and they, they didn't just fall. They threw them at them. That, that was quite an interesting thing, you know. And then uh, I asked them about modern times, more modern times. I said, those are way back. But I, I, on, on these things, I know that I'm safe in what I say because... That it's already recorded that way. But he even talked about about helping people in these days, like like creating fog for people to hide in, and uh, uh, bringing up uh, wind and uh, oh, other things. He said there's so many so many ways that they help people. He said, you can't imagine. We're always doing it, ministering, ministering to people. Help things that people think are coincidence. He said, we're just on the job. Do you know that because there's not a lot said about them in the Bible, we, angels have not been, we haven't realized the, the forces that God uses to get his job done, you see. But God let Paul see it, and, and David saw it. And he, he said, he spoke of the, of the tremendous numbers of angels and the greatness of power and so on. And Paul said, every one of them are sent forth of God to minister to those who should be heirs of salvation. So he knew all about it, but God uses them. And he, God doesn't want us to worship them, but he does want us to be aware of them. Something that, uh, that, that God told me when I, a year and a half ago when I was with him, God gave me a, quite a Bible education because he took me through, through the Bible told me some things that were real important. But to hear it now from, from the angels' viewpoint, it sounds a little, little bit different because they, uh, uh, they can, you, I can relate a little bit more to them as a created being. But uh, I said, is there, is there anything else that uh, you could tell me that was a real interesting time? And so uh, this, this, this big angel who accompanies Gabriel said uh, well he said when the uh, when we put the walls of Jericho down that was a good time he said that he said he said I was the captain I was the captain that met Joshua there 
I uh, almost felt like like I was like, getting kind of weak again there when he told me that uh, in in awe of him, you know. But he said that the that the uh, the walls of Jericho went down because, and this is something that God told me. But now I heard the man that was helping to do, it, or the angel was helping to do it. He said when the when the cry was given as Israel went around those walls the seventh time, seventh time that was their signal, their order to get on those walls and push them down into the ground. And he said we pushed them down in all but Rahab's house, pushed them down. And that's the reason why Israel could go right up, every man right in front of him. And the, 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 the record of the Bible says that, that the walls fell down flat. Well, if you have a, a wall 40 feet wide, 40 feet high, if it's laying on its side, it, it would be just about as bad as it was standing on, on its bottom, wouldn't it? Uh, so uh, he didn't just tip it over. They pushed him down so they could, they could get in. And uh, uh, somebody was telling me today that that the uh, the actual excavations show that they've been pushed down almost like an elevator shaft, uh, the, the pressure that, that they put on them. Gabriel did tell me that there would be probably many people because of of the of their desire to to witness what he's doing in in the work of work of God through angels that that they they would be uh, uh, fantasizing, that they would be uh, would be bringing reports here and there. Well, I saw an angel here, I saw an angel there. But he said this, this would be something that, because of people's imagination, would be normal. But he said there will be definite times. But they will come not with, not with just the, not with just the imagination but with the awe and the tremble that people, people's eyes would be open. There's, there's, there's a greater activity. He did say that there would be probably such a very small percentage that would see it. Most people would not see. But he did say that to those people, he was just as near, that God was just as near, that the angelic forces were just as near, that they were doing God's work and they were protecting them just the same as, as what, what I have heard. And this made me feel good. I, I hate to be somebody that's different. And so he, he did tell me that, that, I, that I wasn't any different. That he's working with everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. But I, I feel that it's such a such an honor for this body, for the world, for the world to have a God who cares as much for us. I do feel that many, many areas of, of doctrine are going to have to change to fit God, what, he, what God is really like. Because people have taken it ground level, but when you see what God is, is really like, that he loves people so much. And somehow... If nothing else could happen because of this service, then that you could, you could feel that love that God has for people. He wants people. He's not willing to let them go. This is what Peter is burned into Peter's heart. He wasn't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he's making that effort today. This is what, what God is doing today. He told me was God's backup plan. You might, you might jot this down. That, that people oftentimes will, will uh, grieve the Spirit as the Spirit would draw, call them, to grieve the Spirit because of their rebellion. That they discourage people in talking to them. Say, I don't want you. Get away from me. Don't say any more to me. I, I'll come when I'm ready. They discourage people. But he said these angels are instructed not to listen to any objection at all. They cannot be discouraged.